Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Information Nation. I'm your host, Ken, and we're live on Orion Talk Radio, oriontalkradio.com, theinformationnation.com. It is September 22nd, and I have with me a uh, New York Times bestselling author. He has written Unfit for Command, Obama Nation, America for Sale, Where's the Birth Certificate, and, and now he has the uh, Who really killed Kennedy. I'd like to welcome to the program, Dr. Jerome Corsi. Dr. Corsi, welcome to the program. Uh, Ken, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, I really like, I, I want to get into this right away. Um, and one of the things that, that, that has been, um, to me, uh, kind of a question, you know, we've had numerous books written on Kennedy. We've had numerous documentaries. We've even had a Hollywood motion picture. What motivated you to write another book about Kennedy? Well, I, I go back. I mean, <clears throat> the, my father was a labor union leader, and I knew the Kennedys. I, you know, when I was a kid with the McCollin Committee hearings going back to 1957, I was aware of what was going on. I knew the families involved. Uh, J.B. Elkins, who was the uh, top witness, the star witness, who was one of the gangsters from Portland, Oregon, that permitted. Kennedy to go after the mob moving into the um, Teamster Union. I got to know the Elkins family very well, and I have followed it on a firsthand basis since the assassination. And I uh, have always studied it, have I've researched it for 50 years, and I figured that at some point or other it would be time to write a book. And Joseph Ferris said, do it now, and this is the 50th anniversary. And so, you know, I decided it was uh, time to put it all together and tell the story as I knew it. And the story, as I'm able to tell it, I think has a lot of information people just don't know. Uh, and it's clear that the uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was a patsy, that there, was, there were multiple shooters. The ballistics evidence uh, makes it impossible for one shooter to have killed Jack Kennedy. And um, yet we've got books, you know, Bill O'Reilly's book is out there, and with the politically correct version of Lee Harvey Oswald was a sole shooter. And I thought it was just important to really get a book that people could read that, you know, was not so detailed or so expert or so esoteric that you had to be an expert to start into it. And I want to tell the story from who the people were and how I knew them and really tell the story of the times because – this is not history. This this explains uh, this explains the politics we're dealing with today, the new world order, the kind of wars we're fighting. Uh, Jack Kennedy's death was a threshold moment in American politics when the um, dark forces won, when the CIA got away with a coup d'etat. Mob combined with the CIA, and that's the story I'm telling. And I want to get into some of the detail today and explain it to the listeners, but it's time America realized that we've been lied to for 50 years, not only about the Kennedy assassination, but increasingly our politics in general. And Democrats, Republicans, you know, the it's really been both sides. It's hard sometimes to even tell the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans. But what you can know is that what we've become after the Kennedy assassination is uh, a form of government, a situation that Kennedy was doing everything he could to prevent from happening. And so I thought it was important to write this book, to get on the record what I knew, and to uh, share with the American people the inside story of what really happened. And I wrote this book with a determination to make it so that the average person could get into it and hopefully wouldn't be able to put it down. Well, I found it extremely interesting. There was a lot of stuff in there that I did not know. And um, it, it got me more involved into looking uh, at the Kennedy assassination. And one of the things that I found interesting with the assassination is that they brought him down and he made the turn onto, I think it was Houston Street, and then made that big sweeping turn Ooh. onto Elm. Still connected? Yeah, where Elm is, Elm is, uh, goes straight Hello. through. Hello. Oh, boy. Right. Are we connected? Yeah. Are uh, how is the connection going? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, um, but, 
I couldn't figure out why they brought him down the route the way they did. And then on top of that, why he shot him on Elm Street and didn't he had a much clearer shot on um, Houston Street. Well, see, that's one of the key issues. And the, um, you know, I want to first make it, I want to make a couple of points really quickly. And that is that this was the third attempt to kill Jack Kennedy that month. And all the assassination attempts were the same. There was going to be a shooter from a tall building with a high powered rifle. And that was the Patsy. That was not really the person who was doing the shooting. See, let's just take a look at Dallas and the, this Dealey Plaza. When you're coming down Houston street, uh, you've got from the Texas School Book Depository a straight-on shot of the car as it's coming down Houston Street. Oh, great. We are having a problem with our Skype. That's just what we need. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Let's, uh, I think great. I'll kill the video, make it a little bit easier for us to talk. I think we're having uh, Skype problems with the video. Are we okay? Well, you, I mean, I've connected you again, so you've got it here. Okay, so you were talking about he had a straighter shot coming down Houston Street. Right, it's, it's straight on. And then right below the window on the sixth floor, there's a hairpin turn that's made. And this turn um, is, the car almost comes to a complete stop. And if you look down from the window on the sixth floor at the school book depository, you're looking right into the car. You've got a full-on shot of everybody in the car. Are you hearing me? Are we with me? Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's the best shot. You know, instead, Lee Harvey Oswald is supposed to wait until the car turns that angle and is accelerating up the street to go towards the triple underpass on Elm Street and waits until the car is behind a tree and fairly far down the road. I mean, it's not even immediately on Elm Street when the shooting starts. After the car emerges from behind this tree... The shooting starts at about a 5.8 to maybe maximum seven-second range. But the only thing you can see at the target from the sixth-floor window now is the shoulders and the back of the head. Now, uh, this is not an arcade game. You know, you're not going to get more points if it's a more difficult shot. And I think anybody who's a sniper, anybody who is a shooter, um, knows you take your best shot. Yeah, had it been me, I'd, I'd have nailed him on Houston Street. I wouldn't have waited for the turn because there was there's nothing obstructing your view at all. Not at all. Or even if you wanted the turn to be made. In other words, once that turn is made, the car has to go all the way down Elm Street to the triple underpass. There's no other way out. You know, but coming down Houston Street, the shooting started, you could have continued straight. You wouldn't have had to make that left-hand turn. But once the left-hand turn is made, the car is committed. And you've got shots then, you've got shots all the way until the triple underpass, and the car has got to keep going. And you've got the shortest distance from the sixth floor window right then. So it makes no sense at all, except that, you know, I had a professional sniper work with me in analyzing this, the, the situation, a, a Marine-trained sniper. And the only point it makes is that once the car is turned, you created a kill zone, and if you've got a, a team of shooters, you can now position your best shooters closer to the underpass where you've got a very close shot, and you can take a headshot. Yeah. So, you know, the idea of shooting from that window and waiting doesn't make any sense at all. And if you want to say this is a logical event, that this is something that was calculated, Lee Harvey Oswald in that window would have begun shooting the minute the car started turning. He could have gotten two or three shots off full body on John Kennedy right then before anybody could have reacted. And the kill would have been very clear and very obvious. But instead, the difficult shot is one that's very hard to, to hit when you've got a limited target moving away from you. And also... Elm Street, the street from the Texas School Book Depository to the Triple Underpass, is declining at a three-degree angle. If you've ever walked it, you're going downhill. Okay. Uh, and also, it's an S-curve. So the car, every few inches, is changing the angle of the shot, which means that if you're even a professional sniper, the tendency is going to be to shoot high. Because as you see the target, by the time the bullet hits, 
the car is moving ahead and down. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be aiming essentially low for the bullet to get there and hit the target uh, the way you want it to hit. Now, the initial shots on John Kennedy, first there was a back shot and there was a neck shot. Those were the first two shots. You can see when Kennedy comes out in the Zapruder film from behind the sign, he's got his hands reached up to his throat, mm -hmm. and he's pushed slightly forward. Now, those shots did not kill Jack Kennedy. He probably would have survived those shots. But between that point, the limousine is emerging from behind the sign. It's going about a couple seconds down the road, and there's a shot that massively blows apart the head. Okay, now, those shots, I'm confident, occurred from closer and different shooters. Um, for instance, the ballistics are different. Uh, the shot in the back in Bethesda reached in only about as far as one knuckle of an index finger. The, the, you know, the autopsy doctor put his hand, his finger in the wound and could not, he felt it coming to an end. Mm -hmm. And then the throat wound in Parkland Hospital, all the doctors describe it as an entrance wound. It's like a puncture wound. It's about the diameter of a lead pencil. Okay. okay. And that wound was observed as a front entry wound. And, of course, a front entry wound means there's a second shooter because by now school book depository is behind you. So any shot from the front entering means another shooter. And if you take a look at the ballistics, okay, so there's no clear exit from the wound going into the throat, and the back wound does not penetrate the body. But yet the wounds to the head further down the road, further away from the Texas School Book Depository, explode the head. So ballistically, I mean, it would seem like the shots to the back and the neck were either lower caliber, lower velocity, or the shot to the head was an exploder bullet, maybe a hollowed tip point, maybe filled with mercury, a bullet that when it hit the head was going to explode the head. Yeah, and yeah. clearly, it, it, yeah, that, would, that would indicate different weapons, different ballistics, different bullets, different guns shooting those shots. And no sniper in the middle of a five or six or seven second shot is going to change their weapon. Yeah, that well, was that was something else that we were talking uh, that that I read in your book. At first, they said it was a Mauser that they found yes. in, the, in the depository. Well, now a Mauser, and of course, the guys, the police who went in there that day, the ones who are are looking for the killer, I first identify that they found a Mauser, and all the reports from the Dallas police that day, they even come out and they go on the radio and say it's a Mauser. Now, a Mauser would make sense. A Mauser is a semi-automatic weapon. I mean, you could have even gotten a M1 Garand mm -hmm. uh, mail order. That would have, in 1963, there were surplus World War II weapons. They, just like the Mannlicher Carcano, you could have bought them very cheaply by mail order. And a M1 Garand is also a semi-automatic weapon. You load the shots with a clip. And then yeah, down through the top. I used to shoot an M14. Down through the top. You push the clip in, and as the bullet is shot, the next bullet automatically chambers, which mm -hmm. means that, you know, you've got your aim set, you fire a round, the next round is available almost instantly for firing. A bolt-action weapon, which is what the man like a Carcano is, each round, even though you load the bullets with a clip, each round has to be chambered by manual bolt, out, bolt action. You've got to pull the bolt back, which ejects the round, the cartridge. Then you've got to slam the bolt forward, which chambers the next round. And you've got to reacquire your target. Now, at the range that Kennedy was shot, which is not, you know, it's a few hundred yards. It's not the distance of a... Um, you know, about th 3,000 yards. It's not a mile shot. This is a close-in shot. If you've got a scope, the scope brings everything in big magnification. So it's actually harder to reacquire your target with a scope than it would be no scope, 
even if you were having to manually chamber the round. So the weapon that Oswald was using was really not equipped or not the best weapon. A Mauser, which they said they found, would have been a much more appropriate weapon. And clearly, having seen the shooting, the police looking for it, one of the police who owned a sporting goods store, and you know these were men who had been who'd fought in World War II, they knew weapons, they knew what an M1 Garand would be, or a Mauser, and no one would use a manual a bolt action gun. It would be like using an old Springfield from World War I. It, it, they're not nearly as accurate, and they're not nearly as easy to use. Uh, so the idea that the weapon that Ali Harvey Oswald used was this um, Italian issue weapon, which even in World War II was not considered to be a particularly accurate weapon. The way it was manufactured, the way it was designed. I mean, a Mauser is a precision, it's a German precision designed weapon. Yeah, yeah. And, and the M1 Garand, if, if you shot one, you know, you know, our, our rifle platoons, our, our infantry in World War II used the M1 because it was a very accurate weapon. It was a little bit heavy, but in the field, it held a clip with eight rounds. You can load the thing. The rounds were easy to get in. The clip automatically ejected, and you could fire very accurately, and a platoon firing an M1 Garand was very deadly. But, you know, platoon firing, bold action, man looker Carcanos with the Italian army was a joke. Even if they chambered the rounds, they weren't hitting anything accurately. You know, it's the last kind of weapon you want to go into the field to kill the president of the United States, a high visibility target with a weapon that cost under $20 mail order. And it was never considered to be a reliable weapon. It was a joke. Was there any indication that... uh... Um, Oswald ever went to the range or anything? I mean, you, you just don't take a weapon and just go out and try to kill somebody. You've got to sight the thing in. Well, there was a guy who was in the range, but, you know, the problem is that the, as I show in the in the book, there was uh, the, the intelligence agencies were using the Oswald ad- identity, and it's not clear that the Oswald showed, that who showed up on the range was doing anything except another Oswald, another use of the identity. Uh, and trying to establish that he was on the range. The guy who was on the range, this another harebrained thing, he shot at the guy's target next to him. Well, now, if you've ever been on a range, a guy pays for the target. You know, and w- even that target only costs, you know, a few pennies or a dollar. You don't shoot another guy's target. No. And that's, you know, that, you're, you're asking for a fist fight. You know, you shoot your target. You shoot your target in your lane. And uh, the uh, idea that the guy who was claiming to be Oswald on the range shot somebody else's target is an indication to be recognized. Because the guy next to him, what are you doing, buddy? You're shooting my target. And the guy said, oh, I thought I was shooting at the president of the United States. Well, I mean, this is nonsense. See, as I point out in the book, finally the Warren Commission recognized that they got information. There's a memo from Lee Rankin, the chief counsel, that they found out that Oswald, the month he was, uh, the assassination occurred, was on the payroll of the FBI as an informant. And Oswald had a, uh, an, a CIA file that went back to 1957. It's a thick file. The CIA was following Oswald every step of his life for, because this these files that were maintained in the CIA by James Angleton were files from military who were defecting to the Soviet Union, but they were defecting as double agents. They were really still loyal Americans. They were trying to penetrate the KGB. And Oswald was in that category, or he wouldn't have had that file maintained in the CIA. Now, when the Warner Commission got this information, instead of making it public because it would have thrown awry the theory that this was a lone nut assassin they they lied the the warren commission came out and they said we can't find any evidence that oswald was associated with any government agencies or intelligence agencies or law enforcement and it was a total lie Uh, the 
the FBI agency in Dallas that had been following Oswald burned his file. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's amazing I mean, when you when you look at the Warren Commission and you look at uh, Arlen Specter who was on it, and somebody else. Arlen Specter, uh, you write in your book, is he was the one that was really pushing the uh, the magic bullet and the one uh, the one assassin theory on this whole thing. Well, see the the commission. I also point out uh, Nicholas D. B. Katzenbach, who was an assistant attorney general working for Hoover. Uh, almost immediately writes this memo to Lyndon Johnson in the White House, like a day or two after the assassination, and says, we've got to get a commission. We've got to do something, because we've got to pin this on Oswald. We can't let anybody find out that maybe the KGB was involved or there were connections. Clearly, the FBI didn't want anybody knowing that they knew Oswald. I mean, even Bobby Kennedy. Well, Bobby Kennedy got called by J. Edgar Hoover and finally told that Lee Harvey Oswald was the suspect in custody, Bobby Kennedy had already heard Lee Harvey Oswald's name. He knew this file existed from Angleton and the CIA. So Bobby Kennedy, hearing it was Lee Harvey Oswald, had to say, wait a minute, this whole thing is a complete setup. This is this makes no sense at all. Dr. Bobby Corsi? Kennedy knew this was somebody the CIA was following. Yes. Hold that thought because we're going to a hard break and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> but it's, it's it's been fascinating so far. Uh, this is Ken from the Information Nation. My guest today is Dr. Jerome Corsi, whose book is Who Really Killed Kennedy? And we'll get back into discussing this book right after these breaks, uh, these messages from our sponsors. So don't go away. This is the Information Nation. I'm your host, Ken. My guest today is Dr. Jerome Corsi, author of the book, Who Really Killed Kennedy? Uh, Dr. Corsi, we were talking about Robert Kennedy and how he'd known that the uh, Oswald name had been thrown around. Would you like to pick it up from there? Well, I, I point out Oswald had a file maintained by the CIA uh, since about 1957. He was in a program where we were encouraging certain U.S. soldiers to defect to Russia as if they wanted to give up their you know, allegiance to the United States, but really this was to penetrate the KGB, and Oswald was in that program. And uh, Bobby Kennedy knew who the files were. They were maintained by James Angleton, who was a, a buddy of Alan Dulles, and uh, Kennedy would have known the name Lee Harvey Oswald, Bobby Kennedy would have, uh, as Attorney General. And so the, Oswald was a known entity, in the U.S. intelligence apparatus. He wasn't just some lone nut like the uh, Warren Commission tried to represent him. That's completely a misrepresentation of who Oswald is. And what I'm pointing out when I wrote Who Really Killed Kennedy is that, um, that, that if you want to get deeply into the assassination, the um, plot is one that involves the highest levels of U.S. government, which is something, by the way, that... Jack Ruby said after he was in uh, you know, in prison and convicted of the uh, killing of Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, Ruby was right. Uh, the Kennedy assassination began uh, when Jack Kennedy decided that he was not going to uh, invade. It, it, the Cuban uh, invasion had started the Bay of Pigs early in his administration. There's a long story behind that as well how Kennedy did in Nixon on that, because the original Bay of Pigs was planned to be a October surprise by Richard Nixon. It was an Eisenhower plot that was going to invade Cuba in, in October 1960 before the election in an attempt to swing the election to um, Nixon. Nixon was going to run the invasion. Jack Kennedy found out about it in the fourth debate. He said, I think we ought to invade Cuba. So the invasion got called off. But then when Jack Kennedy was president, the CIA came back around and said, unless you want us to tell the story of what you did to Nixon, and Nixon was furious about this. Um, so Jack Kennedy had to go along with the plan, even though it was a harebrained plan. I mean, it was, again, total lie from the CIA. The CIA wanted the American people to believe these were freedom fighters invading the Bay of Pigs to take back Cuba, you know, former Cuban expatriates who were coming back to take their country over again. It was a mercenary army trained by the CIA. It was trained by E. Howard Hunt, who had done the same stunt in Guatemala in the 50s under Eisenhower, 
when we uh, created a mercenary CIA army to invade Guatemala to have a coup d'etat against the head of Guatemala, who was returning land from the banana company to the people. CIA decided they were going to change the government and ultimately kill the head of state in Guatemala. They did so with a patsy, with a palace guard, who they said shot the president. Of course, then they said the palace guard committed suicide, so the palace guard was dead. No <laughs> investigation. This was the patsy model developed by the CIA, Alan Dulles, with Eisenhower, and it got applied many times, but eventually Dulles decided to apply it to the United States in a coup d'etat to kill Kennedy. Well, to follow this story through of the Bay of Pigs, when the <clears throat> this invasion army hit the beach, they were getting slaughtered and, and arrested by the Castro army. And uh, Alan Dulles and the CIA thought they could force Jack Kennedy's hand into having to approve and then launch a... U.S. Navy airstrike from a carrier offshore Cuba that would have saved the lives of these guys, but then it would have meant the United States was at war with Cuba, because this would have been a Navy fighter jet military attack on Cuba, uh, would have envisioned, you know, likely caused a confrontation at that point with Russia, which the uh, CIA was desirous of doing. Jack Kennedy said no. <laughs> Jack Kennedy realized that the CIA had lied to him, that they'd created this plot, they were trying to trick him. And, of course, as president, you, you know, you, have, you realize here you've got a rogue CIA that is manipulating you, trying to make you play their script, but they didn't share their script with you beforehand, trying to corner you, corner you into embarrassment where you, as president, will be responsible for this failed invasion or failure to support the invasion, well, in fact, the whole purpose of this failed invasion was to fail, so you'd be forced as president to launch a military strike against Cuba. Kennedy said no, wouldn't do it, wouldn't fight a lying CIA war, and he fired Alan Dulles and Richard Bissell, the guy from Yale, never in the military, who had concocted this you know, lying scheme to invade Cuba. And this was, I think, the beginning of the death warrant of um, uh, Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy also refused to fight CIA wars in Laos and in Vietnam. But what I do in the book is I then say, okay, now who is Alan Dulles? And this is where I think it gets really interesting. The Alan Dulles was um, with his brother, John Foster Dulles. This was a very well-connected political family in America, blue blood, Yale, uh, Connecticut, uh, connections, and they were part of the um, Brown Brothers Harriman investment firm on Wall Street before World War II. Well, what Alan Dulles and his brother John Foster Dulles were doing is they were financing Hitler's rise to power. We funded the Nazis. Yes, yes. there's, there's a, lot a lot of people, people that are aware of that. And when you study the data, and the data is uh, amply available, it's been suppressed. But, you know, if you go back into the National Archives and dig it out, as I've done, you'll find the confirmation of this. The partners of Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, and, of course, they were working also for law firms. They were, you know, one was a lawyer working with Cromwell and Sullivan. Well, the partners were the Bush family patriarchs because um, Preston Bush – and George Herbert Walker were members of the Brown Brothers Harriman firm, the Harriman Brothers firm, and uh, they were together with the Dulleses financing Hitler. And the, the bunch of them, including the Bush family patriarchs, were running a Nazi bank in uh, New York, headquartered the Union Bank, that um, Franklin Roosevelt closed down in the early days of World War II. We financed Hitler. And then if it wasn't enough, Alan Dulles, during World War II, went to Bern, Switzerland, where he spent World War II with James Angleton, you know, the guy who was maintaining Oswald's file. Mm -hmm. And they were working for the OSS. And what they were doing in Bern, Switzerland, was that Dulles 
was in communication as early as 1943 with the high command of the Nazi government. They were dealing directly with Bormann, who was Hitler's secretary, really number two in the political structure of the Nazi party. And Bormann was like the treasurer. He had all the money, all the stolen gold, all the stolen art, all the stolen revenue, all the investments had come through Bormann that were going to IG Farben and the other industrial companies that were building the Nazi war machine that we financed. <laughs> we're also preparing, and by this point, running the concentration camps. Because remember, the concentration camps were often set up to support German corporations like IG Farben. Certainly in Auschwitz, the IG Farben was the major industrial company that was using slave labor, out Jewish slave labor out of Auschwitz. Well, the Dulleses knew this. And the Dulleses were helping Bormann move Nazi money out of Germany in anticipation that Hitler would lose the war. And where were they investing it? Well, they Dulles set up in Switzerland uh, investment agents in Swiss banks. The money was moved through Swiss banks and invested in the U.S. stock exchange. The Nazis through World War II were making major investments in the U.S. stock exchange and in countries like Argentina. Nazis were preparing for there to be an industrial structure for the top Nazis to go work in once they had to flee Germany at the end of you know, the Nazi regime because right after the Nazis were chased out of North Africa, the handwriting was pretty well on the wall that we were going to beat the Nazis eventually. At any rate... We also, through Dulles, created Operation Paperclip, which Dulles ran. And Operation Paperclip brought at least 10,000 Nazi scientists, I think as many as 20,000. The files are in the National Archive. I've studied them. I've written about them before. Many of these scientists were Nazis, committed Nazis. Uh, we brought out, for instance, Werner von Braun who was up the head of our space program. Werner von Braun created the ballistic missiles of the United States, the intercontinental ballistic missiles in the 50s, and he created our space program. Werner von Braun also created the V-2 rocket for the Nazis. He designed it, created it. It was a terror weapon launched against London, and it was manufactured with Jewish slave labor. And of course, we brought Werner von Braun over, and Werner von Braun was on the Walt Disney show in the 50s, and he was a big national celebrity, we conveniently forgot that he had participated in the killing of the uh, Jewish concentration map, uh, camp um, incarcerees, slave labor, you know, thousands of whom died making these V-2 rockets. And we brought all these Nazi scientists to the United States to began creating our post-World War II industries. Again, industries that were benefited by Nazi investment. We also took the entire Galen, uh, Heinrich Galen, and created this, or Reinhard Galen, his name was, created this Gestapo organization that had been uh, working clandestinely to penetrate the Russians. And uh, we hired the whole Galen organization and made it one of the pillars of the CIA. We also made it the, the pillar of um, uh, West Germany's intelligence organization. So we built our CIA, we built much of the post-war industry on the Nazis. And I think a good argument that I, I've made in the book is, by the way, the New World Order idea is a Nazi idea. See, the, the Nazis, people forget, were national socialists. They were leftists. The Nazis were opposed to the communists because the communists wanted the government to take over business and to run collectives. Nazis didn't want that. The Nazis wanted government to be a partner with business where government could fight wars, where the munitions could be built, and that would re-industrialize the country as Germany re-industrialized with the investment from Wall Street, Dulles and Bush family arranged, uh, and created war industries that brought Germany out of the World War I Depression. Now, it was okay also, by the way, with the Dulleses and all the rest of them, that the 
wars be fought on lies, you know, the Reichstag fire, which most likely was a Nazi uh, uh, terror incident designed to push the German people into allowing Hitler to gain more control as chancellor. But at any rate, that lie was part of the whole way of manipulating and moving a population into a frenzy to back this war effort. And it was the Hitler idea to have a massive social welfare state for all the people too stupid, uh, too, um, they wanted to manipulate his sheep, they weren't going to tell the truth, and they just pay them welfare benefits. Old old like today. Well, very much, I mean, I think we became the National Socialists of today, this Nazi model we use. This is the New World Order. The New World Order is this model where national boundaries don't make any difference anymore and the, and the businesses operate trans-border and the money is provided by the International Monetary Fund and the EU rules Europe, these international groupings of countries. And a, a good argument can be made that you know, Hitler would have loved to have Germany dominating the EU, which it does today, and Merkel looks like she just won re-election. Germany's going to continue dominating the EU. Yep. And a massive intelligence agency. I mean, what we have today with the NSA, uh, we've built monitoring every conversation on the Internet, monitoring every telephone conversation, reading every email. The Nazis, this was the Nazi dream, <laughs> to have this kind of a surveillance organization that could monitor the population and know everything about the population so as to know who ought to be put in concentration camps and who shouldn't, who deserves to go to the FEMA concentration camps or the thought reform or, you know, which groups should and should not get IRS tax-exempt status, etc., based on their political ideas, and if they're not useful to society. That's so, a bad thing today. People don't remember their history. They don't have any idea of the history. And what Jack Kennedy said to the CIA when he fired Alan Doss was he gonna, it was going to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. And I put point out in the book and who really killed Kennedy that one of the mistakes Jack Kennedy made was to think he could do that in a second term. Because by leaving the CIA in place, Jack Kennedy left in place the vehicle where Alan Doss, now in disgrace, fired who, by the way, shows up appointed by Lyndon Johnson on the Warren Commission, mm -hmm. could architect the coup d'etat, which involved the assassination of Jack Kennedy. And Dulles set about to do that. Now, as Jack Kennedy also refused to go into Laos, because Jack Kennedy did not want to fight a war that was really a civil war, in a, in a third world country that was not critical to the national security interests of the United States. There was no chance Laos was going to attack the United States. It was this lame brain idea of domino theory of communism. One country was going to fall to communism. The next country was. Laos had hated China forever. If the Laotian people were, Chinese, were communists, they still didn't like the communist Chinese any more than the Vietnamese people liked the communist Chinese. So we got to sold another lie. And Kennedy, if you listen very closely to his first inaugural, says, yes, we'll pay any bird price, we'll, you know, any burden. If you want your freedom, we'll help you. He did not say we'll fight your war for you. So Kennedy did not commit the U.S. military to Laos, which upset the CIA drastically. CIA had a guy within it named Lansdale who was trying to architect the army we've got today. Lansdale realized we needed an army that could fight asymmetric warfare, guerrilla action. It wasn't going to be another World War II. We probably weren't going to fight Russia. We probably weren't going to fight China unless we used nuclear weapons. But we were going to have to have a, an army, fast response that we could put into situations like Iraq, like wherever in the world. You know, we've used this in Afghanistan. We're threatening to use it in Syria. What was the army that Lansdale wanted to experiment with to create in Laos or Vietnam? Also, there were billions of dollars, if we could fight these, that would build American munitions. You know, before 
Vietnam, when we had a weapon system, there was a dozen companies that could make that weapon system. After Vietnam, Bell made all the helicopters. They had a monopoly. Each weapon system had a manufacturer. And that was a license to make billions of dollars. And we, between the Army and the Navy, the Air Force, all the military, wanting to fight this kind of a war, and the industrial complex, which, which Eisenhower warned us about, the CIA was happy to lie the American people into these wars, very much as World War II had been engineered with the Nazis lying to the German people, and Dulles was happy to do it. Jack Kennedy said no. He wasn't going to do it. In fact, the speech Jack Kennedy had in his pocket the day he died, he was going to deliver at the World Trade, at that Dallas uh, Trade Center, the World Trade Center, which was owned, by the way, by Clay Shaw, who figures into the assassination. Garrison was mostly right. At any rate, Garrison and Clay Shaw is another intelligence agent not tied with the CIA. Um, the whole idea that Kennedy was going to communicate in that speech was military assistance. We'll provide military assistance to Vietnam, but we won't fight their war. I say in an interview, and of course, say I and my family, I was a kid, I was 17 years old. I, didn't, I was a truant from school. I got a Harvard PhD. I really didn't like attending school. I spent a lot of time with my dad, and I would, we would, I, I'd, I'd say, I went and got a strategic bombing study at a library. I said, give this to Kennedy. You know, what are you going to bomb in Vietnam? The strategic bombing studies show we beat the Germans, not by bombing their cities. That just made them mad. It was when we bombed their oil, their chemical plants. You know, with a guy like Albert Speer, the Germans were making as many tanks and Messerschmitts by the end of the war as at the beginning of the war because they take these bombed-out factories, they diversify them, and they continue manufacturing. But they didn't have any oil. They didn't have any diesel fuel left. They didn't have any way to keep these war vehicles going. They didn't have any chemicals. We bombed their chemical plants. I said to Kennedy, you know, if you're going to fight a guerrilla army, that's what I wanted them communicated. And what are you going to bomb the, the forest? It's not going to make any difference. These people are going to fight with an army that can survive in a pocket of rice. And they're not going to have, you know, the Ho Chi Minh Trail isn't a, uh, it's not like, it's not like I-95. It's not a four-lane interstate limited access highway. It's a trail through the jungle. Yeah, That's yeah. how they're going to resupply. What are you going to bomb? You know, and, and and if these people don't want to fight their own war, we're going to put in. We ended up putting five hundred thousand troops in there. You still can't win a civil war when the people aren't behind fighting the war. Now yeah. the the last straw was when DM was killed, and Kennedy had given orders that DM not be assassinated. He was the premier, the the president of Vietnam, and his wife was touring the United States. Kennedy was notified in November 63, he was in, going into a meeting, that uh, DM had been assassinated. Well, Dr. 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 Morris, we have run out of time. <clears throat> and that's, I hate to say it.